Welcome back, class. We're going to talk for a few minutes about just ethics and, you know, I guess the basics of business ethics and their place in healthcare. And when we talk about the place, of, you know, for business ethics or the place of business ethics in any industry, it, according to the the author and the in the text, there's there's three distinct levels. Uh, and the first one is morals. And he describes, or the text describes morals as direct rules we ought to follow. Again, normative statement, we ought to follow. Um, don't lie, don't steal. Um, interesting because that, I think those are probably the, the morals that most companies assume that their employees ought to follow is you don't lie, you don't steal. Um, if I think about in the healthcare environment, you've got, and I'm gonna take the government out of it for just right now, but there's there's three main players when it comes to morality and, and ethics in healthcare. I have the consumers, the buyers of healthcare goods and services, patients, members, covered lives, whatever terminology you wanna use, I have the health plans. The health plans are, are, are the facilitators, and we'll get into that in some of the, the you know, subsequent models, but they are the facilitators. If you think about financial markets, you've got, uh, you've got clearing houses, Chicago Board of Trade, Mercantile Exchange, New York Stock Exchange. Uh, clearing houses ensure that buyers and sellers come together in a market and they both function according to the parameters in the contracts that they both negotiate. So I've got patients, I've got health plans or payers, and I've got providers up on the other end. And what you will find when we're talking about, you know, ethics and ethical dilemmas and, and you know, morality issues, it it impacts or can be impacted by all three of those segments or those you know subsets, patients, health plans, providers. And also you've got sitting over here, kind of, you know, eye in the sky watching everybody, you've got public policy. And there can be issues with public policy too, especially when it comes to allocation of resources and uh, uh, the distribution of, of wealth and things like that. So. You, you want to you want to make sure that as we move into this healthcare environment, that we think about that again the three main players: patients, health plans, providers. And when we talk about when I when we talk about the the patients or the consumers, you, you know, I kind of break them into um, you've got I, I take and I pull out Medicaid and I pull out Medicare Advantage, those are managed by, you know, CMS and their government types of programs. TRICARE is managed by DOD, VA is, you know, managed by the Department of Veterans Affairs. So when we're talking about the commercial plans, commercial health plans, commercial benefit plans, you've got the majority of them, you have some private pay and you have some independent or some, you know, that they can buy out on the market, but the majority of, of healthcare on the commercial side, it's, it's through employer groups. Fisk University is an employer group. They provide healthcare to their individuals. Starbucks, an employer group. They provide healthcare uh, benefits to their um, employees. So employer groups and the employees, it gets, it, and again, I, I'll get into it a little farther down the road, but there are some definite ethical issues when it comes to employer groups and employees and how they provide information to a health plan when they purchase benefit plans and they sign up and the information that they provide. When you're talking about health plans, uh, you have issues with, uh, you know, contract, contractual issues. There's, there's, Ethical issues, you know, you get this ethical conflict between, you know, what the contract says and, you know, morally, what, you know, what, what, you know, morally is right. Um, if I go back to my 
the days of in graduate school, I worked at bartenders, you know, worked as, you know, as a waiter. And uh, there, there's always this struggle, at least in the service industry that I uh, performed in. In graduate school was, you know, what's morally correct and, you know, kind of what's ethically correct. You know, here's, here's what the restaurant or the bar owner told you that you had to do. But there's also this underlying moral struggle. So I would have people come in and, you know, they'd come sit at the bar and, you know, they'd order, they'd order a steak and, you know, the steak would come out and, you know, it, and it, they want, maybe wanted it, you know, well done. it come out and it was medium. And, you know, I would, you know, to holler at one of the waiters and have them take it back. And um, I knew exactly what was going to happen when that steak went back because the chef just, oh, it would just blow a gasket. Uh, and I was always just cringe, wondering what that steak was going to look like when it came back out. Because trust me, if you have ever worked as in a restaurant, whether you're a bartender, waiter, you know, working in the food line, if you've ever done that, you probably would never go out to eat again because what goes on back in a kitchen of a restaurant, um, it, 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 it crosses that moral, ethical dilemma to the point that, again, you, you would probably never go out to eat again. So, um, you, you, you know, and even, even now when I go into a restaurant and it, it, you know, I try not to think about what goes on back in the kitchen and if something comes out and it's not cooked the way it should be, I know better than to send it back. I either, you know, I either grin and bear it or I just don't eat it. Um, but those are some of the things and, and it transcends, you know, that type culture transcends, unfortunately, into um, some aspects of a health plan. Um, patient comes in the emergency room. Um, and, you know, and at that point, you come into the merch room, you, you know, you, you tell them that you're not feeling well, you go back to a nurse, that nurse triages you. And at that point, the nurse decides, do I have them hang out in the emergency room and under a situation, which they call observation, where they're not exactly ready to admit you to the hospital but they put you on a gurney and maybe push you into a hall. They, or maybe they've got a room where they can pull the curtain across there and set you in there. But it's, in a, in a lot of that, it's trying to determine whether they want to admit you or not. But in some hospitals, it's not only just patient care they're concerned about, it's the financial arrangement that they're concerned about, which is gonna make them the most money. Keeping you in an observation, I guess, not sweet, but keep you in an observation status, or do they go ahead and niche you? So again, moral and ethics driving, you know, being driven by that ethical dilemma. Um, and then, so you've got, you've got morals. Don't lie, don't steal. Um, you've got those issues where, again, corporate culture, the CEO, sets a corporate culture and the corporate culture should be from a moral position you don't lie you don't steal then you go to the second level and that's defined as ethics and it's the production of morals again on the morals you hear people talk about the moral compass their moral compass has just gone around ethics is the production of morals and, and the author talks about them you know talks about it you know the moral factory, and it's the production of guidelines. So the guidelines, you know, morals are the guidelines, the ethics are the, the, the moral factory that produces the guidelines. And then lastly, you get academics, which they talk about metaethics, and it's a study of the origin and rules of ethics and morality. You know, it's who defines the rules, what's the theory surrounding the ethics and morality, um, what's the origin of the entire, you know, ethical discussion? And in, in most organizations, you're going to have the culture, the ethics, the, the moral compass established via the senior management team. And, and typically the CEO has 
the largest amount of input in that. And then if, as we're walking through this first chapter of the text, we come to, uh, again, go back to you know, the social sciences and you know, it's the social sciences are focused on how individuals, how rational individuals make choices or how consumers make choices. And we talk about it, so the text talks about it now, you've got normative ethics, the discussion about what to be done and it's, um, and it's the discussion about what ought to be done. And then you've got descriptive ethics. It's a study of what people actually do and why they do it. Normative ethics, what ought to be done, descriptive ethics, study of people, why they do and how they do it. And if you go back to normative ethics, I think about things like pharmaceutical prescriptions. I think about moral hazard in healthcare. Uh, I think about you know, self-interest and optimization. Uh, I think about individuals, especially uh, with the uninsured that uh, share IDs. Uh, it, it, there's, there's just, there are a lot of instances either in the, the patient component, the health plan component, or the provider component that while things ought to be a certain way, Nine times out of 10, they don't turn out to be that way. Um, and then the, the text moves kind of in to a situation where um, they talk about ethics versus other forms of decision making. And you know, the, the first thing they talk about is law. The legal environment is just linked to ethics. That's, you know. Legal environment linked to morality and then links to ethics. Um, they talk about ethics from a from a practicality or a prudence perspective. Um, then you know you may think about selling street drugs. Selling street drugs, individuals use that to to generate disposable income and use the disposable income to better themselves or maybe better than fa their families. Uh, we talk about ethics and religion. Maybe you've had somebody in your life that um, is, you know, driven. I you don't know, say driven. Maybe somebody in your life that has provided you with your moral compass uh, through the, through the religious side of the house. I'm growing up on a on a farm, we uh, hired several individuals to help us on the farm, and one of the one of the individuals that uh, Worked for us on the farm. His, um, his brother. His brother was the local bootlegger. You know, grew up in Kentucky in a dry county, so the only way you could have alcohol, or you know, at that particular time, was um, you had to you had to know somebody that uh, was selling on the black market. I mean, if if you think about if you think about the state of Kentucky, uh, most of your bourbon is distilled in Catholic areas. You know, Frankfurt, Lexington, Louisville, Owensboro, you know, Northern Kentucky, around Cincinnati, uh, Bowling Green, Kentucky, which was the county seat of the of the county where I grew up, was a wet, it was a wet area. So you could buy alcohol in Bowling Green, but to get to Bowling Green, you know, you're talking about 15, 20 minute drive. It, you know, it was, it was, it was not convenient. And so we had the local bootlegger. And there were on more than one occasion, I would go down to pick up uh, my workers at and sometimes I'd have to pick them up six, seven o'clock in the morning because we had a lot to do. And I'd go down to pick them up. And you know, it was always kind of funny that the people that you saw coming out of the bootleggers with their alcohol. Judges, uh, city council, Baptist preacher, uh, you saw a lot. That, and, and again, it's, you know, so you've got morality, you've got ethics, you've got religion, and that's, you know, that's, it's just one way to get from point A to point B. You've got also authority figures, your parents, your coaches, your teachers. Uh, 
you've got, you know, peer pressure. You've got, you know, customs. You've got conscience. Um, you know, and you know, the, some of the some of the things that that you found in, um, especially healthcare, just just the it was the me it, it's the mechanism with which the health the benefit plans are structured. So typically, your benefit plan runs from January the first to December the thirty first, at least in a commercial health plan. Um, Medicare Advantage, still. Medicaid, still, similar to commercial. But if you look at TRICARE, DOD, their, their health plan was set up, at least on traditional TRICARE, was set up on the fiscal year, the government's fiscal year. Government's fiscal year goes from October the 1st to September the 30th. And when I worked at HealthNet and we managed the, the TRICARE population in you know, California, we saw, you always saw this huge spike in services in late July, early August. And at that time, a lot of the, a lot of the some of the TRICARE book of business was, uh, you know, based on, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the liability piece of it um, was based on it. Once you hit, you know, you're talking about a deductible. Once you hit that deductible, then the rest of your health care was on a copay basis. So you'd have like a thousand dollar deductible. You hit that and then the rest of your services, you'd pay, you know, five dollar copay, ten dollar copay, whatever. And we would see this huge spike in services late July and August, because everybody had hit that deductible for that fiscal year, and now all of a sudden everybody was doing everything that they needed to do under that fiscal year in late July, early August, trying to wad it in there so that they could get it at a cheaper rate. And it was especially concerning when it came to pharmaceuticals. You had individuals that, in what they call a high desert, and Southern California, and it's it's you know talking about Barstow, Hemet, um, and a lot of the individuals that had retired from the military in Southern California, they like the weather, couldn't afford places like San Diego and L.A., and so they would retire to the high desert, and you would see these individuals, and they would come to the Naval Medical Center in San Diego to get the pharmaceuticals because there was no a copay if they got it in the military treatment facilities, they would take and combine all of their all of their scripts, and they may send one person driving down there, and they would drive down from the high desert to San Diego and fill all of these scripts. They would either get them filled at the at the military treatment facility, or if they didn't have it on the pharmaceutical list, they would go to the local Walgreens, CVS, or something. And you always saw these huge fights, and so. That's what I'm talking about when it comes to just ethical, moral issues in especially healthcare. You see these phenomena or these um, really weird looking uh, blips when it comes to healthcare goods and services, the consumption of healthcare goods and services. And again, we'll get into that in some of the, uh, some of the later classes or some of the later modules. Uh, when we talk about the history of, of ethics, um, you know, everybody's tempted to take some. That's kind of the history of ethics. Uh, Plato, they, in the text, they you know talk about his discussion of right versus wrong principles. Uh, make decisions based on facts, principles, and rules. And that's, you know, kind of the teaching of Plato. Um, 17th, 18th centuries, the fundamental ethics and, and natural rights, you know, theory of freedom maximization. Your freedoms are bounded by other people's freedoms. So you're only going to be as free as uh, some of the other, some of the things driving other people's freedoms. I think it was, I think it was John Locke, the, the English um, philosopher that said, where there is no law, there is no freedom. And John Locke, if, if you remember from your econ classes, is one of the huge uh, proponents of property rights. 
He was a driver of property rights. In the 1800s, it was uh, John Stuart Mills. Does the act benefit the general welfare? And I think it was Mill that, that talked about, well, the act uh, may not be ethical or moral, but as long as it benefits the general welfare, maybe maybe it's okay to, to, to continue to move in that direction. Um, then you had Nitschke that, that talked about the in interpretation of reality, right versus wrong. And Nitschke says, well, it all depends. And um, I think that's, that's, where, that's where the dilemma is, especially within healthcare today is, it comes back to kind of like Nitschke says, it's well, you know, right versus wrong. It, it all depends on the situation. The historical development of, of uh, business ethics, we, we talk about, you know, it was started, kind of jump-started in, you know, 1974. Um, people, were, you know, especially in the financial markets, they were finding, you know, fraudulent resumes and, you know, you know financial um, dealings that weren't above board. Um, and so that kind of jump-started the study of business ethics. By 1980, uh, it was studied in many universities, uh, especially on the environmental and financial fronts. And uh, business ethics, they started coming out with training for business ethics. I can remember at Ohio State taking a business ethics class. It was one of those required classes. And, you know, sitting there and, you know, listening to the professor drone on and on. It was like, oh, God, yeah, when, you know, how much longer is he going to talk? But uh, at the time, I didn't think too much about it. Um, and this was probably 80, probably 86, early 80, maybe it was winter quarter, 87. Ohio State was on a, on a quarter system at that time. Um, I don't think it was a summer quarter. But, and then all of a sudden, you know, you roll around in October the 19th, 1987, you know, what's considered Black Monday. That's when the stock market, the bottom fell out of it. And, you know, I think we talked about the United States losing $1.71 trillion in, in value. And all of a sudden, the light bulb starts to come on. You know, as a graduate student, you're thinking, okay, well, maybe this business ethics thing, maybe there's something to it. And uh, that, again, that kind of jump started business ethics and, and people started uh, to pay more attention to business, et business ethics and, and think about um, what, what really goes on with business ethics. And with that, I'm gonna stop. We'll come back for a third component. We'll just talk about is business ethics really necessary? Talk to everybody in a minute.